Our planet's biggest and meanest supervolcanoes are waking up. When they erupt, you'll surely notice it, even if you live thousands of miles away from the epicenter. Scientists are worried we might not have enough time to prepare and deal with the consequences of a super eruption. There's some volcanic activity close to the Italian city of Naples. And no, it has nothing to do with the famous Mount Vesuvius, but with another volcano. This one is harder to see, as it doesn't have a tall peak like Vesuvius. But don't let this bad guy trick you. It could be way more dangerous than its giant neighbor. It does have a huge crater that's about 8 miles wide. This volcano is called Capi Flegre, and it's actually one of the largest volcanoes in Europe, sitting under the town of Pozzuoli. So, Capi Flegre erupted 39,000 years ago with a bang so massive it spread ash across the whole Mediterranean region. It also caused the temperature to drop by over 16 degrees Fahrenheit across Eastern Europe. It was the biggest volcanic eruption in Europe in 200,000 years. Since then, Capi Flegre has had smaller eruptions, and the last one happened in 1538. Now the area is full of small craters, hot springs, and bubbling pools, and they're all proof that this volcano is still very much alive and brewing something. Since the early 2000s, the ground in the giant crater and the town nearby have been slowly rising by about 1 to 1 and a half inches every year. There were at least 150 earthquakes that shook this supervolcano lately. In May 2024, there was a 4.4 magnitude in the area, the biggest in the last 40 years. Residents had to leave their homes and camp outside, fearing there would be more earthquakes. No one knows how Campi Flegre is going to behave in the following months or years. But the authorities are organizing evacuation exercises to prepare the population just in case. The Italian volcano looks like an innocent kitten compared to the real giants like Yellowstone. For a volcano to deserve the title of a super one, it must be able to produce catastrophic scale eruptions and eject huge amounts of magma, ash, and volcanic gases. The Yellowstone giant meets these criteria. Even though it moves from time to time, the Yellowstone supervolcano hasn't erupted for 640,000 years. But when it does wake up, it might erupt with incredible power, about the same amount as 10 huge nuclear power stations can produce. Under the ground beneath Yellowstone, there's a super hot area full of molten rock called magma. As more magma moves into a big space called a magma chamber, the ground above starts to swell or rise. When the magma cools down, the ground falls. Between 2004 and 2009, the ground at Yellowstone rose by almost 10 inches, but then it started to slowly go back down in 2010. Scientists aren't sure if it's going to erupt anytime soon. There's also another big volcano called Long Valley in California that has been active since 1980, and it can be a really big threat. Scientists studying this supervolcano found out that before its biggest eruption, 760,000 years ago, the buildup may have taken less than a year. Now, that's bad news, because a supervolcano eruption can have a huge effect on the world, like the eruption of the Toba volcano in Sumatra around 74,000 years ago. It became the biggest volcanic eruption the Earth had seen in 28 million years. It covered parts of Indonesia, India, and the Indian Ocean with a thick layer of volcanic debris, almost like a 6-inch blanket. The amount of rock it spewed out was like stacking nearly 3 million Empire State Buildings. The giant crater it left behind can still be seen from space. All the ash and gases shot up into the air and blocked some of the sunlight. It caused a volcanic winter that lasted about 6 to 10 years. Some scientists think this eruption might have even affected early humans. Around the time Toba erupted, the human population took a sharp dip, and there were far fewer people. Some say this is why all modern humans come from a small group of survivors. According to the Toba catastrophe theory, most early humans in Europe and Asia didn't survive the cold and harsh climate after the eruption. But a lucky group lived through all that in Africa. Not all scientists agree with this idea, and some archaeological and climate records show a different story. Another volcano that changed the world in a big way was Mount Tambora in 1815. The next year went down in history as the year without a summer. It was cold and rainy, and there was snow and frost even in the middle of summer, especially in Europe and North America. 
This happened because the volcano sent out a lot of sulfur dioxide into the sky, which spread all over the world and made the planet colder. When Tambora erupted, it caused huge tsunamis that smashed homes and took the lives of around 10,000 people. Afterward, about 80,000 more people passed away because of the consequences the eruption had caused in the world. The cold weather ruined crops, so food became really expensive. And because horses were the main way people traveled, the cost of oats that they ate went way up too. Some people even think this led to the invention of the bicycle in 1817, as a new way to get around. The eruption made the Earth colder for about three years. Now, even though the Tambora eruption was so powerful, Krakatoa, another volcano in Indonesia, stole the show when it erupted in 1883. It was just easier to spread information about it through telegrams and photos. Its final blast was the loudest recorded sound in history, and people could hear it on 10% of the entire Earth's surface. The eruption started a tsunami, with waves about half as tall as the Statue of Liberty. Now, if we only had 12 months to prepare for a supervolcano eruption, it would be really hard to store enough food and get ready. But don't panic just yet. Supervolcano eruptions are very rare, and the last one happened 26,500 years ago in New Zealand. Scientists think that a super eruption happens once every 100,000 years on average. But the sad part here is that the Earth doesn't follow a perfect timeline. There could be clusters of super eruptions with shorter gaps between them and then longer quiet periods. Since there have already been two super eruptions in the last 100,000 years, there's always a chance one could happen again sooner than we expect. Plus, although there are places like Yellowstone and Long Valley where we expect volcanoes to erupt, there are less obvious possible hotspots. In Chile, there's a volcano called Laguna del Maule that has erupted in the past and left behind a huge crater. Over the last 20 years, the ground there has been swelling really fast, rising up to almost one foot a year. Some people are worried that this could be a sign of a big eruption coming. But scientists say there's not enough magma yet to cause a super eruption. In Bolivia, the Juturangu volcano is also acting up. It's part of a group of volcanoes that have caused super eruptions in the past. Since the 1960s, the ground around Juturangu has been lifting. But the last eruption was 250,000 years ago. Even though the magma might be rising, it's not enough to worry about just yet. The chances of a super eruption happening during our lifetime are 1 in 1,400, which is pretty low, so you don't need to worry too much. But just like someone wins the lottery every week with very small chances, a super eruption could happen sometime in the future. And when it does, we'll need to be prepared. Whoa! Earth's surface is shaking! Long cracks split the ground open. Lava rivers are rapidly flowing down the slopes. Deafening noise is filling the air. Rocks and other debris are flying high up. Clouds of volcanic gas and ash cover the sky. Now, this is not a plot of a blockbuster disaster movie. It's what happens when super volcanoes decide to erupt. But this is likely not the scenario that will take place when the world's largest volcano, Mauna Loa, decides to finish its long, long nap. In 2021, scientists were sure it would happen soon. But so far, nothing. The volcano's seismicity keeps increasing and then going back to normal. But you never know when this giant will finally come back to life. That's why experts have been monitoring geological activity on Hawaii's largest island for quite some time. The Big Island of Hawaii is made up of five volcanoes, including the most active on the planet, Kilauea, and the largest, Mauna Loa. This gigantic thing makes up almost half the landmass of the island. And what lava Kilauea emits in one day, Mauna Loa could spew out within 20 minutes. That's what it did in 1984. While Mauna Loa's smaller sibling has been throwing tantrums for a while, the giant has been slumbering ever since its last eruption. But very recently, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory has recorded more than 200 mini earthquakes below Mauna Loa. It likely means an increased flow of magma down there. Good morning! The volcano might be waking up, or not. If Mauna Loa did suddenly erupt, lava flows could reach the ocean and the most populated and touristy places, like Captain Cook, very, very quickly, in a matter of hours. 
1984, the last time the volcano erupted, lava got as far as the outskirts of Hilo on the other side of the island. That's where a campus of the University of Hawaii is found. Luckily, people had a few weeks' warning to get ready for the disaster. These days, locals have special go-bags ready with the most important stuff, including documents and money. Such precautions can come in handy in case of an emergency evacuation. Even though most Mauna Loa eruptions have so far only affected the summit area, several of them sent lava all the way down to the ocean. And you never know how powerful the next eruption will be. Now, what is the highest mountain on Earth? Mount Everest, you say? Well, it depends. From seafloor to the summit, Mauna Loa is a thousand feet taller than the famous Himalayan peak. The volcano is so big, it makes the Pacific plate it's sitting on literally slump under its weight. Scientists say that when this monster of a volcano erupts, the volume of lava coming out per unit will be life-threatening. Over its recorded history, Mauna Loa has been erupting regularly, almost every six years. And even though the last eruption of the volcano occurred about 40 years ago, scientists are certain it'll happen again. Now, remember the scene I showed you at the beginning? Well, you can relax. It's not likely to happen with Mauna Loa. The thing is, big island volcanoes, including Mauna Loa, aren't very volatile. That's because they're shield volcanoes. These volcanoes got such a name because they aren't really very high and resemble a warrior's shield placed flat on the ground. Shield volcanoes get formed by very fluid lava. It travels farther and forms much thinner flows than lava erupted from a stratovolcano, which is conically shaped and tall, like the infamous Krakatoa in Indonesia. So if, or should I say when, Mauna Loa erupts, there probably won't be ash clouds and tons of debris. The most dangerous thing will be lava. Since Mauna Loa is a shield volcano, its lava is extremely fluid and voluminous, which allows it to flow far and fast. Using theoretical vent maps, experts from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory have made charts of possible lava flows. They're kind of worried about earthquakes clustering at high rates. It likely means that lava is on the move under the surface. 500 to 600 earthquakes per day are a serious reason to be on high alert. On the other hand, it doesn't necessarily mean a disaster or inevitable eruption. Around a decade ago, several earthquakes that happened at the same time signaled that something was happening under Mauna Loa. But an eruption didn't occur. Instead, half the volcano shifted a bit to the south. This way, it probably gave more room to magma so that it had enough space to stay beneath the surface. Now, let's get back to the catastrophic eruption we saw at the beginning of the video. That's what often happens when a supervolcano erupts. Those are volcanoes that have at least once had an eruption with a volcanic explosivity index of 8, which is the largest recorded number on the index. Supervolcanoes are often extremely large, with no cone at all. That's because they're typically the remains of gigantic magma chambers that once flared up, leaving behind a caldera. They're usually found over hot spots. Supervolcanoes can produce super eruptions, and when they do, they blow more than 240 cubic miles of ash, molten rock, and hot gases up into the air. In other words, four super eruptions could fill the Grand Canyon to the brim. Supervolcanoes get formed when gigantic volumes of scorching hot magma are trying to escape from deep underground. This magma rises close to the surface but can't break through Earth's crust. That's why a huge pressurized pool of bubbling magma gathers at a depth of only several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more magma is trying to get to the surface until, bam, a super eruption occurs. The most recent super eruption happened in New Zealand. Well, when I say recent, I mean around 26,500 years ago. Nah, I wasn't around then. That's when a supervolcano beneath the surface of Lake Taubo spewed into the air more than 300 cubic miles of ash and pumice. Imagine 500,000 great pyramids of Giza flying up at the same time. That's how incredibly powerful that eruption was. But the most exciting and confusing thing about the eruption was that the Taubo volcano simply didn't go off like many others. At first, everything was going as usual. 
more than 200 square miles of magma had built up under the surface, and the pressure was getting higher and higher. But after the rock cracked and the first part of lava rushed out of the crater, something went wrong, and the supervolcano took a break. Only several months later, the disastrous eruption shook the ground, and thousands of tons of lava, rocks, and ash flew high into the atmosphere. But the age of supervolcanoes isn't over. The most infamous of them all is probably the one in Yellowstone National Park. This giant handles at least three mega-powerful eruptions, and who knows how many smaller ones. If this monster erupted anywhere as strongly as it did 2.1 million years ago, it would spit out more than 588 cubic miles of red-hot material. You can probably picture it more vividly if I tell you that this volume is comparable to 65 million capital rotundas in Washington, D.C. piled together. Wow. Anyway, scientists are sure that Yellowstone doesn't present any danger these days. For an eruption to happen, magma inside must be at least 50% molten. With the Yellowstone caldera, this number is just 5 to 15%. But of course, Yellowstone isn't the only supervolcano on our planet. There's also New Zealand's Tabo you already know about, Japan's Airy Caldera, California's Long Valley, Indonesia's Toba, any of them can one day produce a super eruption. There are also several so called supervolcanoes that haven't lived up to this name yet because they've never produced anything like a super eruption. For example, in 1883, Indonesian volcano Krakatoa went off. The power of the eruption tore the volcano's walls open, and cold seawater rushed into its molten insides. The difference in temperature made the volcano blow up with a deafening boom. It was clearly heard 2,000 miles away in Australia. It earned the blast the title of the loudest sound in history. But even though the consequences of this event were truly catastrophic, it still turned out not powerful enough to be called a super eruption. Phew! You can finally send that last report for the day and breathe out. The weekend is around the corner. But just when you're about to hit send, you're alarmed by the low rumbling under your desk. Is it the light rail passing by? Unfortunately, that's not the case. It's a volcano speaking. What, here? In Arizona? That's right, the ground keeps shifting under Arizona, reminding us that Earth is alive. No panic though, let's arm ourselves with some context. 20 American states have extinct, active, and dormant currently sleeping, volcanoes. Among such states, you can find California, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. On the bright side, Arizona's volcanoes are dormant at the moment, but it doesn't mean they won't go off in the near or not so near future. Now, how about traveling to Arizona to check the traces of its active volcanic past? They dot the desert landscapes of this state like spots dot a Dalmatian. There are entire volcanic fields southwest of Phoenix, east of Douglas, near Flagstaff, north of Kingman, and near the Mexico border. The most worrying thing about these fields is that even though they're not active at the moment, eruptions in this region might happen every thousand years or so. Well, the time seems to be up. The last powerful and destructive volcanic eruption occurred around 1,000 years ago at the Sunset Crater. Oh, this place is worth paying more attention to. And we will, but a bit later. First, we have to talk about hotspots. No, not that place where you can surf the web. In our volcanic context, a hotspot is a place where insane amounts of heat melt the overlying crust. Earth's thin outer layer and form volcanoes. This heat rises from the mantle, which is located between our planet's dense, superheated core and the crust. Want to see an example of this type of volcanism? Welcome to the Hawaiian Islands. The Big Island has its active volcanoes because, at the moment, it's situated on top of the Hawaiian hotspot. The older Hawaiian Islands were once there too but later they drifted off towards the northwest. It happened because that's where the oceanic crust on top of which they sat, namely the Pacific Plate, moved. 
Now, look at the world's ocean basins. Yes, they're literally dotted with islands that sit on top of hotspots like Hawaii, Iceland, Samoa, the Galapagos. Those are probably the most famous examples. But don't think that continents can't host hotspots. They can, but those are far less common. One of the most famous continental hotspots is, ah, I bet you know it. Yep, the one beneath the Yellowstone caldera. By the way, the caldera is a vast volcanic crater, especially one formed as a result of a massive eruption that led to the collapse of the mouth of a volcano. The Yellowstone hotspot is basically the creator of Old Faithful and the rest of the hot springs and mud pots for which the national park is famous. Speaking of Old Faithful, let's make a small detour and pay more attention to this wonder of nature. It's one of the most well-known geysers in the world. People have been coming from all over the globe to see it for more than a century. The cool thing about this geyser is that the likes of it can only form under very specific conditions. That's why they're pretty rare. Magma under the surface superheats pockets of underground water. The pressure there keeps growing until it eventually pushes the water upward with immense strength. A certain volcanic rock with a high silica content lines the tunnel through which this water escapes. Basically, it creates a unique pipe that can withstand unbelievable pressure and heat created by the water erupting above the ground. Old Faithful was the very first named geyser in Yellowstone. If you come to visit it expecting the thing to erupt every hour on the hour, you're gonna be disappointed. On average, Old Faithful erupts every 91 minutes or so, which isn't that bad either. Plus, you can download a special app which will provide you with the approximate time of the next eruption. But be very careful while visiting and stay away from the site. The water erupting from the powerful geyser reaches 204 degrees Fahrenheit. The steam is even more scorching, up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hot enough to bake a cake. But let's get back to our volcanic hotspots. Scientists still don't clearly understand why there aren't many hotspot volcanoes on continental crust. One reason might be that the continental crust is much thicker than the oceanic crust, which is about four times as thick on average. Another reason could be that most of Earth's crust, about two-thirds of it, is oceanic. This means that there's less continental crust for hotspots to form under. Now. I bet those of you living in Arizona will appreciate the following info. We'll talk about a volcanic field right in the heart of this state, the San Francisco Volcanic Field. That's a massive area filled with over 600 volcanoes. Yes, they're mostly small, but it doesn't make them any less impressive. They're scattered across 1,800 square miles in northern Arizona, a giant territory. Interestingly, Scientists are still debating about whether this volcanic field is actually sitting on top of a hotspot. But one thing they agree upon, the volcanoes in this area get younger as you move east. And this pattern matches up with the North American plate moving west over what could be a stationary hotspot beneath the surface of our planet. Cool, huh? The volcanic hullabaloo in that area started around 6 million years ago. So, in geological terms, it's relatively young. As for the most recent eruption, it happened less than a thousand years ago. The Sunset Crater, which I mentioned before, the one near Flagstaff, is the most famous vent from that eruption. The Sinagua people had to leave their homes at Wupatki Pueblo because of the eruption. That site is now part of the Wupatki National Monument. There, you can see how people lived in this volcanic region many years ago. If you go to explore this area, you'll notice that most of the volcanoes there are basalt cinder cones, small and steep. The Colorado Plateau has quite dry weather conditions. That's why the volcanoes haven't worn down much. Some of the best examples of those cones, like this one, called the SP Crater, still look like they appeared yesterday. But look around, it's not just cinder cones. The San Francisco Volcanic Field also has a stratovolcano. 
as well as some lava domes that formed from volcanic rocks with more silica than basalt you can find in places like Hawaii. It means they're thicker and don't flow as easily. Anyway, the Strata Volcano is going to be one of the most epic sights you'll come across while exploring this volcanic field. Well, not the Strato Volcano itself, but the San Francisco Peaks, the remains of that giant formation. They stand tall at more than 12,600 feet. That's four and a half Burj Khalifas placed on top of one another. It makes the peaks some of the biggest landmarks in northern Arizona. They're not only stunning, but also sacred to the Native American people who have lived in the area for many generations. Now, unlike those super active volcanoes in Hawaii, the San Francisco volcanic field takes its time, thousands of years between eruptions. But you shouldn't relax just yet. Geologists say another eruption is likely to happen one day. It will probably occur in the remote eastern part of the field, away from big towns. Phew! And if that next eruption is anything like the one that formed Sunset Crater, it would be quite the show lava fountains and rivers of lava flowing. At the same time, the next eruption might not happen for centuries, maybe even millennia. Until then, the San Francisco volcanic field will remain a hidden gem of volcanic history, waiting for its next fiery performance. This is not some hypothetical situation or fairy tale. The Vesuvius supervolcano that erased the city of Pompeii may wake up again and destroy many other towns built near the mountain. And to understand what consequences humanity would face if it wakens this time, it's smart to know what the eruption did 2,000 years ago with the ancient city. So Pompeii was a thriving city in the Roman Empire, located just 5 miles from Vesuvius on the west coast of Italy. It was a resort where the noblest and richest people rested. They walked along cozy streets, lived in beautiful villas, and had fun beside fountains. The soil in this region was fertile since the ground around the volcano had a lot of useful elements. Olives and grapes from Pompeii were sold throughout the empire. About 12,000 people lived in Pompeii by the time of the eruption. It seems not so much compared to modern standards. But it was considered a big city in those days. The catastrophe began unexpectedly in 79 CE. At first, everyone felt the ground tremble. Birds flew away from the volcano as far as possible. There was tension in the air because of the impending catastrophe. The volcano started to release thick smoke, soot, and ash. There was so much of it that soon, it obscured the sky over the city with a heavy gray cloud. Vesuvius spat out gases, rocks, and dirt. Hot ash polluted the air and made it difficult for people to breathe. Locals couldn't see inside this gray haze. And then it started raining heavily. The water mixed with ash and soot and fell on Pompeii. Roofs of houses broke under the heavy weight of mud. Streets, fountains, alleys, and squares were hidden under millions of tons of soot. The next day, the destruction continued with renewed force. There was an explosion of hot gas and crushed rock at the top of the mountain. A devastating blast wave at a speed of 100 miles per hour dispersed in all directions and vaporized all the trees in its path. When the wave reached Pompeii, it turned the city into ruins. On the second day, the eruption stopped. By this time, the great town had been lying under a thick blanket of ash. By the way, this type of eruption is called an explosive one. But when lava flows out of a volcano and causes a fire, this is a quiet eruption. The last time Vesuvius erupted was in 1944. But even today, it's still one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world. But nobody's afraid of it. Three million people live around the mountain, about 20 miles from the crater. If the volcano wakes up, it could be one of the most enormous cataclysms in the modern world. Pompeii was destroyed almost 2,000 years ago. Since then, science and technology have advanced a lot. 
We're planning to colonize Mars someday. We've created a metaverse. But so far, we're still powerless before the forces of nature. An erupting supervolcano can destroy nature around it and cause technogenic catastrophes in big cities. The phone lines would be overloaded and people wouldn't be able to call their loved ones or the rescue services. There would be big traffic jams on the roads. Panic would spread throughout the streets. Fires would start because of falling hot soot. All flights would be canceled, and locals would have to hide in airports, supermarkets, and the subway. A large gray cloud would obscure the sun and make the air hot. The only thing that can help us in such a situation is a preliminary warning about the upcoming eruption and good preparation. So if the disaster starts while walking on the streets, you should take shelter in a car or building. It's better to buy a dust mask in advance that allows you to breathe freely. If there's no mask, cover your nose and mouth with any cloth. If you stay at home, close all doors and windows so volcanic ash can't get into your apartment or home. These incandescent particles can easily set fire to a carpet or curtains. Put wet towels under the door sills. If you need to go outside for some reason, wear a suit covering your body completely. Don't forget about the protection for your eyes. Put on special glasses that have a dustproof function. And remember about the mask. If you have a house, you need to disconnect the downpipes from the gutters to avoid clogging the drains. If your house has a rainwater collection system, you need to disconnect the pipes from the tank. Rain with ashes is a hot, dense mess that can easily break the water supply system. Fill the tub and sink to have water for washing and cleaning in case the central water supply is turned off. Set the lowest temperature on the fridge and freezer. Your food will be stored much longer if electricity is shut down in the city. Go to a room without windows above ground level and wait for a message from authorities on the radio or TV. Keep the receiver close to you so you don't miss anything important. The device must have a full charge, a strong body, and a powerful antenna. Here's an excellent option for survival in the ash apocalypse. The eruption is intensifying, and you hear on the radio about the evacuation. At this point, you need to calm down and follow the instructions from rescuers. Collect a bag at home with food, water, and medical supplies. Your emergency kit should include flares, maps, a first aid kit, sleeping bags, flashlights, a fire extinguisher, a portable phone charger, car tools, and a few charged batteries. You should always have a filled gasoline canister if you live near an active volcano. Going to the gas station is not a good idea during the evacuation. You can get into a long traffic jam and spend too much time in it. If you don't have a car, ask your friends for help or pay someone for a ride. It's possible the city administration would organize buses for evacuation. You would find out about it through the radio. In any case, before leaving the house, don't forget to turn off the gas and electrical devices and shut off the valve with the water supply to prevent your home from a gas leak or flooding. Government officials. So, you're driving a car. The authorities must announce the plans for evacuation. Don't go off the route because some roads can be blocked. Perhaps they will say the eruption is over and you can return home. Maybe the eruption will be so strong that it will destroy the city. Anyway, if you're prepared, you'll have fewer things to worry about. Modern seismic sensors monitor the fluctuations of tectonic plates and the volcano's activity. So the eruption won't be a surprise. Pompeii is far from the only city destroyed by the eruption. In 1785, a similar disaster occurred in the Japanese town of Aogoshima. It was located right in the crater of an active volcano, and one day it woke up. It was sunny weather, and no one suspected a disaster was coming. At some point, the birds rose in the air and flew away. Then the ground began to shake. A heavy low sound came from the depths of the island, and thick streams of smoke and ash erupted from the volcano. 
the volcano threw dirt and big red-hot stones into the sky. It looked like a meteor shower. People evacuated, and the mountain continued to erupt for several weeks. When the ashes settled, the volcano fell asleep again, and people began to return to their city. Despite the risk of a new eruption, they continue to live and work there today. Since then, more than 200 years have passed, and the volcano never woke up. Meteorological and seismological services monitor the situation and seismic activity. After all the horrors and devastation that a volcanic eruption leads to, harmony in nature eventually comes. Decades and centuries later, volcanic ash, rich in helpful food elements, settles on the soil and makes it fertile. Then life will rise from the ashes like a phoenix. Kwajan Volcano in Indonesia is not your ordinary lava-belching mountain. Instead of producing black smoke and red lava, as most volcanoes do, this eccentric guy lets out a blue flame and electric blue lava. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano contains some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. And when the sulfuric gases interact with scorching air and get lit by the molten lava, they start to turn blue. Unfortunately, you can see this mesmerizing sight only at night, but you can smell it all day long. By the way, the world's largest acid lake is also located inside this crater. The Dead Sea has a high concentration of salt and minerals compared to other seas, even though it's technically a lake. Swimming is almost impossible, but people go there for the natural chemicals for the body. Floating on the surface is a great way to relax. This ancient body of water got its name because no macroscopic organisms can live there since it's 9.6 times saltier than oceans. Only a few bacteria and fungi can be found enjoying the salt. It's also Earth's lowest elevation on land at 1,400 feet below sea level. An underground crystal cave exists in Mexico, and it looks like some interstellar world. It's roughly 1,000 feet beneath the surface, with each spike measuring up to 35 feet in length and weighing up to 55 tons. These are some of the largest crystals in the world. Los Cantar Beach is an endless strand of white sand dunes in azure water. But don't let the tropical vibes fool you. It's located in Scotland. That's why it mostly looks like this during May and June only. In December, the place gets only an average of one hour of sunshine per day making it way more dramatic and monochrome. The Georgia Guidestones is a collection of giant stones in a star pattern. It has inscriptions in eight languages, including Hindi, Chinese, and Swahili. It also has an astronomical calendar finished in 1980 and was built the last centuries. No one knows who built it or why. All the way over in sunny California is Sequoia National Park, home to the giant forest. It's been around for thousands of years. More than 8,000 of these colossal trees rule the land, including 10 of the largest living plants in the world. The General Sherman Sequoia is estimated to be up to 2,700 years old and is recognized as the world's largest known living tree by volume. The famous stone heads of Easter Island have been around for hundreds of years. No one knows exactly why they were built. Some scientists think that local people believe the statues would make the soil more fertile. Soil analysis proved the heads did their job well. It's the best agricultural spot on the island. The chemical composition of the ancient hot springs in Pamukkale, Turkey, makes the water pouring over the edge look magical. They're not only good for cleansing your body, but the mind too. All the way in Saudi Arabia is a rock sliced perfectly in the middle with two pieces sitting parallel. What makes Al Nasla so unique is that it wasn't artificially done, but is a result of nature's work over the years. Now, this glacier may look like someone dropped tons of red paint in the middle of Antarctica, but it's actually the natural color. Blood Falls is a result of extreme salted water mixed with iron oxide, giving out this eerie vibe in the middle of nowhere. In early May 2018, New England observed one of the scariest and most dangerous phenomena ever, a super long track tornado. The frightening natural phenomenon started not far from Charleston, New Hampshire, and traveled toward the town of Webster in Merrimack County. 
It took the tornado 33 minutes to cover 36 miles and become the third on the list of the longest track tornadoes in New England. In the Philippines, you can swim in some of the most crystal clear waters and discover an underwater world below you in the province of Palawan. The municipality of Koran has white sandy beaches with many small boats riding through the many amazing sceneries. Tristan da Cunha is a small volcanic archipelago in the Atlantic with the only neighboring cities of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Cape Town, South Africa. It takes seven days by ship to get to this unique place. If you want to escape from the rest of the world, staying with the 280 locals will make you feel like you're away from everything. During the first week of January 2018, unusually cold weather in the Northeast United States froze the Atlantic Ocean in North Falmouth, Massachusetts. What's more, the ocean was frozen so thoroughly that people were walking on the waves. Now, that's obviously something you don't see every day. Red sand is what makes this beach unique and why tourists flock to Tianjin, China. A red-colored plant called the Sueda salsa dwells in the saltwater. The whole beach is covered in red, with only the top layer of the sea visible. If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity, out loud, it's the stone of Davasco in Argentina. The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately today, you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. In 1912, the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people of the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. They made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. Socotra is an alien-like island off the coast of Yemen in the Indian Ocean with one of the most unique trees ever seen. It's called the dragon tree, and it can only be found on this amazing island. In 2008, it was labeled as a World Heritage Site. If you ever see a tight burning column of air, don't panic, it's not the end of the world. The creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno means that you have crossed paths with a fire tornado, also known as fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous phenomenon occurs mostly during wildfires. These fires create a big area of super hot air just above the ground. When this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. The most powerful fire nados can stretch hundreds of feet into the air. The House of Mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon, amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. There's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it, unlike virtually everything else in the shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground, even before the house was built there, and they avoid approaching it. The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place, and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet, and voila! A perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity. A human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes and other senses. Now, if you travel to the Philippines, Indonesia, or Papua New Guinea, you'll have a chance to see some of the most unusual and cheerful trees in the world. The trunk of the rainbow eucalyptus looks as if it had been painted orange, green, red, purple, yellow, brown, blue, hey, you name it! Some trees are so bright that they seem artificial. The rainbow eucalyptus regularly sheds strips of bark, which reveals a bright green layer underneath. A bit later, this green layer gradually changes its color. And since the shedding happens at a different time in different places on the trunk, the tree starts to look multicolored and very attractive. Yemen is home to the oldest skyscrapers in the world and the oldest metropolis. 
the ancient city of Shabam is considered to be the Manhattan of the desert due to the collection of mud buildings popping out of the desert floor. It used to be a caravan stop during ancient times. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system. But the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. And they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTem. It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to 1.5 miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as 3 miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway, remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features, like the Old Faithful Geyser or the Grand Prismatic Spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring, fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. 
That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit. Because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, these bacteria would create a blue-green hue, thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. It's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. But scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes. And the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone Supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5-15%. to 15%. Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hot spot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's a reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. 
But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano, and its volcanic explosivity index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, the eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the volcanic explosivity index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini-earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual. But it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Poland, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew. There should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of many earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, that's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super-eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super-eruption would be ash and ashfall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super-eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. As for the most recent super-eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super-eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It had been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. 
Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, Think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore, and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1,300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal. That's how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate.